Dr. Wise graduated with his bachelor's in biology from the University of South Maine and received his PhD from Purdue University, where he studied autophagy protein dysfunction, specifically the autophagy protein optineurin in relation to Parkinson's disease in Dr. Jason Cannon's lab. Dr. Wise completed, or, um, excuse me, Dr. Wise began his postdoctoral training as a fellow at the University of Southern California in Dr. Caleb Finch's lab studying how air pollution contributes to brain aging and completed his postdoctoral training in 2021 at the University of Louisville in Dr. Lou Sai's lab, where he focused on hexavalent chromium um, in heart and brain toxicity. Some of Dr. Wise's most recent achievements include funding for his R21 grant entitled Hexavalent Chromium Induced DNA Damage Contributes to Brain Aging, and he has recently uh, published a review paper in Environmental International discussing hexavalent chromium neurotoxicity. Today, he will be discussing his current work, which investigates hexavalent chromium and its effect on brain aging. The title of his talk is A Toxic Aging Coin, Hexavalent Chromium, Neurotoxicity, and Brain Aging. And with that, I'll let you take it away, Dr. Wise. Thank you. I'm ready. I hit the share screen first. Huh? Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'm going to talk today about my uh, relatively new research direction, looking at exponent chromium in the brain and brain aging. Um, to give you a, a brief overview, I'm going to start by talking about aging and um, why this is becoming a, a more and more critical uh, topic. Then get into the toxicology of aging, which is really a new direction for both the fields of aging and the fields of toxicology. Um, then I'll talk about some of my preliminary results with cell culture um, and some rat brains, and then finish with some preliminary conclusions from my data and uh, future directions. So the first thing that I want you all to understand is we're facing an unprecedented aging epidemic. Um, these maps here show you the percentage of people over 65, which is kind of the, the, the arbitrary threshold for geriatric. Um, looking at 1990, 2019, 2050, and what you can rapidly see is that dark blue is starting to spread all over the world where you know 15% or more um, are geriatric. Now come 2030, um, if we look at this map here, where we have the year on the x-axis and the population in billions on the y-axis, like this purple line, this is our geriatric group. And you can see it's the group that's most rapidly aging in this window that we're in here in the 2020s. Um, and come 2030, 20% of the population in developed nations will be geriatric. So you know, one in five people will reach a geriatric age. And um, you know, this is, on the one hand, a huge population. On the other hand, they're also living 10, 20, 30, 40 years as geriatrics. Um, we don't know. In the US alone, we'll see several million people reach their 100th birthday by 2030. Um, the challenge here is, on one side, we know we know a good amount about how the, how the body ages. And we know that it's very different than an adult mature body or than, than a, a, a youth developing body. And that biology might, be a, might play a key difference in how our bodies interact with chemicals. So I present this on, as a toxic aging coin. On the head side, we consider how age impacts the toxic effect. Um, as, it, as I said, you know, we, we know that youth have a developing biology and that's very different than geriatrics who have a degenerating biology. On the, on the tail side, we look at how chemicals contribute to aging. Um, this a, new, a relatively new term was coined in the 80s, a, a gerontogen. Um, this is a chemical that induces or accelerates biological aging processes. And this could affect us at any, at any point in our, our lifespan. Collectively, we've established that there are nine hallmarks of brain aging. Um, just to broadly introduce them, you can see that these, these ones up here have to do with genetic aging. These ones over here have to do with cell, cellular um, communication and cellular replacement. And then down here we have sort of meta metabolic aging. 
Uh, my research is focusing on these two in particular, genomic instability and cellular senescence. So I'm going to kind of back up into this from an aged context back to where I think is um, where genomic instability is contributing to it. So first of all, we have cellular senescence and aging. Um, cellular senescence is kind of the equivalent of an aged cell as opposed to an aged body. So as our organs age, they collect more and more of these senescent cells, and eventually we have an aged organ. Now looking at um, various pathologies from animals and humans, we can see that there are higher numbers of senescent cells with, with age. Um, and we can see that if we use senolytics, kind of chemicals that remove senescent cells, that actually alleviates a lot of the symptoms associated with age-related diseases. Um, this is also tightly connected to cell cycle regulation, neuronal cell death, and genomic instability in the brain. Uh, and there's a large amount of evidence that shows that cellular senescence is linked to genome instability and chromosome instability. Um, but the mechanism of how this is linked is rather poorly understood. The, the image here on the right shows you, you know, kind of the simplistic view of a normal cell with a normal chromatin and you know, low oxidative stress. And then we have all of these stressors that contribute to developing a senescent cell, which is characterized mostly by the senescence associated beta galactosidase, um, and increase in oxidative stress, increase in P16 Inc4A, increase in P21, and the expression of these SAS factors or senescence associated secretory phenotype, which is kind of this cocktail of proteases, cytokines, chemokines, uh, growth factors that. Um, also promote neighboring cells to become senescent. So going backwards, chrom you know, cellular senescence is connected to chromosome instability. Um, this image here shows what's presumed to be normal versus abnormal uh, chromosome instability over our lifespan. So we have in, a, in our fetal brain, where our brain's still developing, there's actually quite a bit of uh, chromosome instability, and that, that's important for the healthy brain development. But as we age, that levels off. So um, number three here, this orange line is considered natural chromosome instability trend. Or as we get, you know, as we get to our middle age, it, we have low rates of it, and as we get older, it starts to increase. Uh, if we look at early onset neurodegenerative diseases, that's what we see here in the red, where we start off after development still high with chromosome instability, and then it kind of crashes mid mid, mid age when that early onset disease is set in and those neurons are degenerating. And then with the later onset neurodegenerative disease, you can see it looks a bit more like normal aging, but then we, you know, it, after the disease onset, after the disease takes place um, and progresses, we have neuro neuronal loss, we lose those cells that are, are uh, that have chromosome instability. Um, and really what I'm talking about with chromosome instability um, is kind of like this, this is a, a human karyotype, which normally would express or would have 46 chromosomes. And you can see there's a lot more than 46. Um, and so that becomes a stable phenotype for, the, for those cells. There's way too many chromosomes, and that causes all kinds of stress for the cells. Um, when we look at chromosome instability and aging, um, this is not a new thing. In 1961, it was first described as a contributor to aging. Um, so it's a topic that's had a long history at this point. Um, there are several uh, diseases that are defined by chromosome instability, such as ataxia telangiectasia, and a lot of these chromosome instability associated diseases exhibit progeroid phenotypes or cellular phenotypes of aging. So there's a strong genetic link there. Um, when we talk about the brain aging, Alzheimer's disease is kind of what one of the main ones that we point to is what it happens to when you get old, what's, what's going to happen to your brain. And there's a lot of data out there that shows high rates of chromosome instability um, and that these areas that, that express chromosome instability are confined to the areas that have the worst pathology. Um, and you know, the last kind of thing to, to back up to so the next step, chromosome instability results from dysfunctional DNA double strand break repair. There's actually quite a bit of DNA damage occurring and accumulating with aging. Um, in the Alzheimer's disease brain, we mostly see this in neurons and astrocytes. I don't know that much more has been looked at yet. Um, we see an increase in gamma H2X 
positive neurons and astrocytes in the hippocampus and the cortex. These are kind of the two hubs that we look at in Alzheimer's disease. Um, the gamma H2X is a very reliable marker for DNA double strand breaks. Um, you see some of the repair proteins, the expressions decreased in the hippocampus, um, and we can see if we knock, knock down some of the, these repair proteins, the DNA double strand breaks accumulate, you have ne neuronal loss, and you have impaired learning and memory. Um, it's pretty clear that this DNA damage is occurring very early on in, in Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, prior to any kind of symptoms and prior to a significant amount of um, protein accumulation or neurodegeneration. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of evidence that supports double strand breaks are a major uh, contributor to um, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease associated loss of memory and neurons. Now, I want to emphasize these two papers real quick. These came out this last summer, um, and they're highlighting the fact that we need to establish what this link is between chromosome instability and cellular senescence. Um, and the second one here, um, you know, they're emphasizing that we need a bona fide animal model for aging, which we connect DNA damage to chromosome instability and to cellular senescence, which just happens to be what my um, R21's hypothesis was centered on. Um, so, you know, th this next year I'll be setting up my own animal model to look at how these are all linked um, and how this pathway contributes to, to brain aging and, and cardiovascular aging. Um, so talking about the toxicology side a bit more, the tail side of this coin, um, we have established a handful of, of classic, or what I would call classic gerontogens. Um, George Martin, who coined the term gerontogen, first predicted that cigarette smoking would be um, a significant ger gerontogen, and in fact, it has been, it has been shown. Um, PM2.5 and ozone were the next two that came after. Um, also, UV radiation, but it's not as much of a systemic issue as it is um, more of, you know, you're just for your skin. And what, what you see with all these um, gerontogens, especially in the brain, is, you know, elevated ox oxidative stress, increased protein accumulation, um, impaired learning memory, a whole bunch of stuff that, you, that looks kind of what, what Alzheimer's disease looks like. I'm proposing heavy metals as a class of gerontogens. Um, and so far, one other paper has looked at the potential of metals as gerontogens. Here, they used um, a pretty unique animal study uh, where they had two groups of young animals um, and a geriatric, uh, ger geriatric group of mice. And one of the young groups, they, they gave them a 40% high fat diet and uh, these four different metals in their drinking water for 42 days. And after looking at the pathology and the behavior, um, these young rats exposed to high fat diet and metals looked a lot like these geriatric rats. Um, we saw decreased acetylcholinesterase, which is a really important enzyme in the brain for clearing out uh, neurotransmitters um, during, during synaptic uh, activity. Um, we saw decreased neuronal counts in the hippocampus and cortex. Um, again, the two hubs that we, that we mostly focus on in, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, it increased oxidative stress, and we saw impaired learning and memory and elevated anxiety in these, in these mice. So as far as looking at metals as gerontogens, we know that they can induce genomic instability. We know that they can induce cellular senescence. We know that they can induce inflammation, but we haven't really connected all these dots yet. Um, we also know that metals are significantly associated with neurodegenerative diseases. Um, Alzheimer's disease is associated with lead and aluminum. Parkinson's disease is associated with iron and manganese. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of others. So I'm proposing that metals contribute to aging via this um, DNA damage accumulation mechanism uh, leading to cellular senescence. Um, and to start, I'm focusing on hexavalent chromium. Um, this is kind of a legacy chemical for my family, which is partly why. Um, but also, more importantly, it's it's got a widespread exposure. So, you know, it, 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 pretty much everyone's going to be exposed to it at some point in their life. Um, a lot of it comes from burning fossil fuels, in, such as oil and coal, which we have a lot of here in Kentucky. Um, it's got a lot of bright colors, so it's used in a lot of paints and dyes. Um, and it's really good for making metal resistant 
to corrosion. So a lot of stainless steel, a lot of chrome plating, that's all got chromium in it. Um, and we, we see it a lot in Superfund sites where there's you know, heavy environmental contamination going on. But there's significant health and, and data gaps um, pertain to hexavalent chromium. For example, we don't really understand chromium neurotoxicity. I did just publish a review paper on that, but prior to working on that paper, even I didn't consider chromium uh, neurotoxic. Um, and we, we don't have any data on chromium and brain aging. So, you know, if we if I find that this is a significant concern, this might change a lot of um, uh, regulations, perhaps especially for uh, protecting geriatric populations. Um, we know that chromium targets key aging hallmarks. Um, it's, it's been shown uh, for genomic instability. It's very well established for genomic instability in other cell types and other organs. Um, we also know that it induces cellular senescence. Um, but, you know, again, we don't know how this works in the brain. There's also a really interesting study looking at APOJ and clusterin as a biomarker um, in welders that were exposed to chromium. What they did is they measured these levels before and after um, putting in some engineering controls to reduce the chromium levels, and they saw that the APOJ clustering levels in the peripheral blood came down after that chromium reduction. Um, so, you know, everything's there that I need to get started with this, and I'm, I'm very excited, excited to get started. Um, so just to talk about chromium neurotoxicity a bit, um, this is some of the highlights from my paper. Um, the, the image there shows you where chromium has been reported. As far as the human brain, all the chromium levels have been reported are presumably um, not due to occupational exposure. And what we see from there is the pituitary and the temporal lobe. Um, so the pituitary is this dark red one here, and the, and the temporal lobe is on the side, you know, the back side or, of the image here. Um, those are the two with the highest levels of chromium. Uh, and when we look at Rodent studies that have considered chromium, most of them just look at total brain chromium. Um, so don't really understand where it accumulates in the brain. But there's a couple papers that have shown it, it accumulating in uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary in, in rats and mice. Um, from humans and animal studies, we see that there seems to be an age-associated chromium accumulation. Um, so it's not necessarily being cleared from the brain very quickly. Um, it, it can accumulate over lifespan. There's widespread neurodegeneration in all animal models, and this ranges from fish to birds to um, rats and rabbits. Um, there's been know, a dozen different species that have been considered with chromium neurotox. Uh, and there's also widespread oxidative damage um, co uh, co coexisting with reduced expression of redox enzymes. So a lot of the focus has been on, on that aspect of chromium neurotoxicity. Um, so far, I think only one other paper has considered DNA damage, and they did find a significant increase. Behaviorally, um, especially looking at human populations that are exposed, we see social memory loss, spatial disorientation, locomotor dysfunction. Um, so these are behaviors that are not as easy to pick up. Um, just, you know, hanging out with somebody and they're like, oh, wait, you don't recognize where we are? You know, it, it, it takes a lot more um, investigation to figure out these behaviors as opposed to looking at cohorts um, of people employed in, in these in industries. Um, and there's also a few papers that have looked at environmental chromium exposure in children and have found a significant association with autism and childhood attention development. Um, but there's a lot we don't know about, you know, where chromium goes in the brain. As I'm sure you're all aware, it's a, the brain's a very complex, intricate organ. Um, the image on the top left here kind of highlights that with all of these different arrows pointing to different regions in the brain that all have different functions and different cellular compositions and different biochemical compositions. And so chromium can interact with the, with these different regions very differently, um, depending on uh, how sensitive they are. And then there's also a, um, a rich network of cells that have very different functions in the brain. Um, some are, some are postmitotic, such as the oligodendrocytes and the neurons, which are presumed not to be affected by something that, that a, a clastogen, where you know 
you need to go through the cell cycle to get chromosome instability. However, we do see that there is chromosome instability in these cells. And we have um, cells that are still dividing, such as the astrocytes, the microglia, um, the ependymal cells. Um, these serve more functions with the uh, maintenance, maintenance of the brain, supporting the neurons, uh, making, making sure their microenvironment is healthy. Uh, and so a, a class of genes such as chromium can have a very detrimental effect on how these cells are functioning. Another thing that's not often considered with, brain, with the brain is the cerebrovasculature. The image on the top right there highlights how dense and how, 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 how much um, branching there is in, in the cerebrovasculature. And the image on the bottom right there shows you um, the, the composition of what's called the neurovascular unit. Um, the neurovascular unit is uh, you know, endothelial cells, astrocytes, microglia, neurons, uh, pericytes all working together to make the blood-brain barrier, which protects our brain from um, the peripheral environment in our bodies. So it keeps a lot of stuff out. It dumps a lot of a lot of stuff from the brain to the the, the bloodstream. And as we get older, um, that starts to become more leaky. That starts to become more, um, less efficient. Um, and we don't know how chromium affects any of those cells or or that structure. Um, as far as looking at the mechanism of chromium neurotoxicity, there's not a whole lot, but this is what I could I could glean. Um, after chromium enters the cell, it's rapidly reduced to chromium-3. This reduction process produces reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, and that's likely responsible for the increase in um, MDA, which is uh, uh, lipid peroxidation. Um, the decreased in glutathione, which is a redox enzyme, and also the increase in stress response genes that are typically sen more sensitive to, uh, to to ROS and RNS. And we also see that uh, that decrease in acetylcholinesterase and in increase in neuroinflammation, but it's not clear what about chromium is, is causing these to happen. So I'm wondering um, how does some of these chromium effects in the brain contribute to the aging hallmarks that um, that we're interested in. So, you know, DNA damage accumulation, chromosome instability, telomere shortening, and cellular senescence. Um, as far as how chromium is, is, could contribute to this, um, it's a well-established clastogen or a chemical that induces uh, chromosome instability. Um, Chromium-induced cancers especially exhibit chromosome, chromosome instability and microsatellite instability. Um, and patients that have chromium cobalt metal implants um, there's been a lot of literature looking at how those failed metal implants result in high levels of cobalt and chromium inside the body and how that contributes to neurotoxicity in, in people. Um, but also the peripheral blood from these patients have high levels of chromosome instability. Um, begging the question of how that's contributing to uh, aging in their brains and aging in their bodies. Uh, and of all the metals that have been looked at for chromosome instability so far, the, um, Hexbent chromium has been the best characterized, um, you know, where we know that after chromium exposure, there's going to be an accumulation of DNA double strand breaks. This causes a G2 arrest in the cell cycle. The G2 arrest leads to centrosome amplification and spindle, spindle ch checkpoint bypass, and that ultimately leads to aneuploidy, and that's how we get this, this in, in, instable chromosome number. Um, to look at to look at, into this, um, my R21 is going to look at three different age groups, a young, a middle-aged, and a geriatric, so I can look at the full life spectrum. Um, I'll have both males and females, and I'll expose them to two different levels of chromium in their drinking water. Um, throughout the exposure, we'll do a battery of uh, behavior tests that are focused on um, aging behaviors. So, you know, locomotor function, we expect it to decrease with age. Grip strength um, kind of will decrease, and that reflects frailty in, in elderly. And then memory, depression, and anxiety are kind of some of the neurological or neuro behaviors that uh, we see that are prominent in aged populations. Um, and so with this model, I'll be able to ask this question from both sides of this toxic aging coin. One, how does the age how does the age affect chromium neurotoxicity? And two, how does chromium neurotoxicity contribute to brain aging? 
Um, for now, I'm going to go into some of my uh, the data I've been working on for the last couple of years, um, starting with MO59J and K cells. Um, these I'm, I'm using to link DNA damage with senescence in brain cells mechanistically, and then I'll get into the RAP model that um, I, I, I grabbed some extant brain tissues from uh, my dad's lab to use to define what regions of the brain are targeted by chromium. So these MO59K and J cells were originally derived from a malignant glioblastoma uh, um, from a human male. And then the J cells naturally mutated and lack expression of DNA protein kinase, whereas the K cells are still normal. Now, DNA protein kinase is very important for DNA damage, DNA double strand break repair. So as a result, the, uh, the J cells are deficient in DNA double strand break repair and are way more sensitive to um, things like ionizing radiation, which induces a lot of DNA double strand breaks. For this, for this, these cell lines, I've, this is my workflow. Uh, you know, this is the first time anyone's looked at chromium in these cells. So the first thing I had to do is figure out what kind of dose range can I work with. Um, then I went in to look at the chromium uptake to figure out how much chromium is actually getting into the cells. And then the last thing I, I, I was working on was uh, chromium induced growth arrest. And now going forward, I'm going to start looking at some of the cellular senescence biomarkers um, and look at once I figure out what time and concentration gives me cellular senescence, then I'll look at cellular senescence and DNA damage um, and move forward from there, looking further down the road at DNA damage repair and cellular senescence. So first, figuring out the dose response. Here I'm using zinc chromate. This is, so I've got the concentration on the x-axis and the uh, percent survival on the y-axis. Um, and you can see the K cells in orange and the, blue, the J cells in blue, which are more sensitive to chromium than the K cells. Um, next, I looked at uh, chromium uptake, where again, I've got the treatment concentration on the x-axis. Um, the left here shows you extracellular concentration on the y-axis. Um, so that tells me that these cells were exposed to similar levels uh, of chromium. Then on the right, I've got intracellular chromium concentration. So this shows me that the cells took up the same amount of chromium, so any kind of results um, will be significant for the differences between the cells rather than the differences between chromium exposure. Um, and so that brings me to the growth curve, which is the bit of data that I'm most excited about with these cells right now. Um, <clears throat> so the J cells, which are deficient in DNA protein kinase, are on the left there, and the K cells, which have DNA pro protein kinase and have DNA damage repair active, are on the right. Um, I used three different doses of chromium, which you can see uh, yellow, orange, and red for increasing concentration. And then I used the toposide as a, a positive control, which is known to, to induce cellular senescence and also known to induce um, DNA double strand breaks. And what you can see pretty clearly is the K cells appear to be going senescent or at least have growth arrest for all three doses, whereas the J cells um, have a bit more of a dose response when it comes to growth arrest. So the lowest concentration didn't seem to affect the growth at all. It's right there with the control, whereas the highest dose is flatlined with a Um So what this tells me is if chromium is going to contribute to cellular senescence, if I do actually have senescence here, uh, in the next couple months I'll figure that out, DNA damage repair has to be active to become senescent. If it's not active, the cells will continue to grow. So that becomes a very provocative question for me as far as how this DNA damage pathway contributes to cellular senescence. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, going forward, I'm going to start looking at some of the senescent, senescence markers, such as beta galactosidase, P16 in 4A, and P21. Um, and then I'll measure uh, SASP using a, a kit to look at to see if I have um, uh, uh, an inflammatory phenotype. And then going forward, I'll look at DNA damage after I've established this, this cellular senescence. Um, and this should round up to a really nice paper. Second approach is used in the RAP model to define what regions of the brain are targeted by chromium. Uh, the RAP model we used was oral pharyngeal aspiration of zinc chromate. Um, they were given zinc chromate once a week. Um, for this study, we have done the 24 hours and the 90 days so far. Um, and we did both males and females, and uh, I'll be presenting 
data mostly from the 90 day um, 90 day time point and you'll see I've got um, controls and then 0.4 and 0.8 uh, mill, uh, parts per million. Uh, this is a really big study. Um, you know, it involved three different labs um, and we collected most of the major organs and um, three different biomarkers um, to, to get a very thorough investigation of how chromium is affecting the health of these animals. Um, for my workflow here, I'm using um, the silver stain, uh, which is a pretty standard uh, kit for staining dying neurons this jet black color, um, whereas li living neurons get kind of this brownish color. And then I'm using this rat brain atlas to figure out which regions have these dying neurons. Um, and that that's uh, directing me to where I'll look for DNA damage and nerve formation, cellular senescence, uh, blood brain barrier damage, and protein aggregation. And then the results from this will feed into the six month chromium study to figure out which kind of behaviors we want to target. So first of all, start with the hippocampus. Um, you can see the control on the left here. Um, here's the hippocampus with all these dense neurons. And then on the right, here's the point, the lower, lower concentration. Um, and what you can see is we, we've got so these, all these jet black neurons in the 0.4 treated and only a couple, you know, one here, and one here in the control, which you know, we expect to see some neurodegeneration naturally. And take a closer look at this, you can see you know, a big collection of dying neurons in the 0.4 and only you know, a few in the, in the control. Some of the other regions I've seen, or I've highlighted here, um, the thalamus, the inferior olivary nucleus, the medial vestibular nucleus, and a handful of others. Um, so this is consistent with the literature where we have widespread neurodegeneration neurodegeneration going on. The next thing I've started to look at is figuring out this gamma H2X staining in the brain. Um, what we expect to see is, you know, an untreated control, there's a little bit of H2X, but then when you add uh, DNA double strand break inducing agents such as a topicide, um, you have a lot more of this H2X um, in, in the nuclei. Um, so for this approach, um, I start off by looking at um, the number of gamma h 2 positive cells in a given area. Um, then I'll, I'll do, I do ROI analysis where I use Nikon Element software to kind of trace the nucleus and that gives me a readout of how much the, how bright the intensity is there um, for gamma h 2 x And then finally I do a foci analysis to count all the, count the number of, of gamma h 2 x foci per nucleus in an untreated versus a treated. So the first thing I want to show you is just a qualitative difference between the control and the, our highest dose um, looking in the cortex. So on the left here you see is the control and there's a whole bunch of blue nuclei and you know only a little bit of green. Whereas on the right here you can see the cortex from the highest dose and you can see most of those nuclei are now green um, so they have a lot of DNA damage going on. Um, now, look, next was to look at the gamma h 2 intensity, where I did the ROI analysis. Um, and on the graph there, I've got two different regions, the cerebellum and the cortex, control in blue, the uh, highest dose in orange, and the relative gamma h 2 expression. Um, so you can see that the, the controls there are at 100%, basically take the average raw value of the control, call that 100, and make everything else relative to that. Um, and you can clearly see that there's quite a bit more gamma H2X going on in these cells um, in the uh, treated brains rather than the controlled brains. Um, and that's also true for the average number of foci per nucleus. Um, the cortex seems to be more affected than the cerebellum, um, but this is you know, pilot data with relatively no low numbers. Um, so I expect that that cerebellum number might come up with uh, uh, more experiments being added to this. So to wrap up my preliminary results, I've established a dose response for chromium in these mo 59 k and J cells. I have suggestive evidence for growth arrest, maybe cellular senescence after five days. Um, and a key thing there is the literature generally says for in vitro stuff, you need at least five days exposure to induce cellular senescence. And that's where it, it seems to start. Um, that's where the growth arrest seems to start for um, chromium in these cells. I have suggestive evidence for increased neurodegeneration in the cerebellum, the cortex, and the hippocampus, and I have suggestive evidence for increased gamma h expression 
first affirmation and uh, labeled nuclei in uh, at least the cerebellum and the cortex. So for some upcoming studies, I've got this um, drinking water study from IR21. We've got the six month exposure for the oral pharyngeal aspiration. I also just got back from spending two months in Maine to learn how to work with the African turquoise killifish, and I'll go over a couple quick slides on that. Um, and then I'm also working in uh, wildlife into, into, into my studies because I do um, also adhere to the one environmental health approach where we look at how the health of humans, the health of wildlife, and the health of ecosystems are all linked and how learning from each one of them can enhance what we understand for the others. So for this African turquoise killifish, just real quick, um, this, these are considered the shortest living vertebrate species that we can keep in captivity. They naturally have a four to six month lifespan going from uh, you know, freshly hatched to dying of natural old age. Um, that's largely because they are from these eph ephemeral pools in sub-Saharan Africa, where you know, the, the wet, wet season only lasts four or five, six months. Um, so to cope with that, the embryos enter a diapause stage to survive the dry season, and when the rains come back, it reactivates development. And then um, within a month of hatching, um, these fish are, are sexually mature, ready to reproduce. And so going from one embryo to the next generation, it takes about 40 days. Makes them a very, very appealing model to work with because you can do um, multiple aging studies within a year. You can do multi-generational studies within a year. Um, and because of this rapid age, natural aging, they're becoming a very uh, more prominent, much more prominent model for aging. Um, they were first proposed in 2003 by uh, Dr. Celerino in Italy. Um, at this point, there's four or five different strains of these fish. Um, the, the genome's been assembled and annotated from two different labs um, and is available online. Um, and they have highly efficient CRISPR-Cas9, which makes them really uh, useful for genetic studies. And you can establish a stable um, genetically modified fish within two or three months. Um, and also their telomeres are much more comparable in length to us than um, rats or mice or zebrafish. Um, so for our purposes, we went up to learn how to work with these fish um, and do some pilot studies, expose them to, to chromium. We used one milligram of chromium per liter of water, uh, did a 96 hour exposure and did daily locomotor tests. Um, and then when we sacked them, we collected pretty much all the organs, which you can see here. Um, and so what we're gonna try and do is measure the chromium in all these. Um, the size of some of them leads me to think we're gonna have to pool some of these organs um, as opposed to looking at each animal individually. Um, and here's some of that pilot data looking at the locomotor behavior. So the blue is the control, the orange is the, the chromium treated, um, the y-axis is the day of chromium treatment, or sorry, x-axis is the day of chromium treatment, and the y-axis is the total distance that the fish traveled in about 10 minutes. Um, the left is juveniles, which were one month old, so you know just at the uh, age of being sexually mature. And on the right are our geriatric group, which were about six and a half months. Um, and again, you know, they have a four to six month lifespan, so these are really old fish. Um, you know, it looks like we have a bit more of an effect with chromium in the geriatrics than we do in the juveniles, um, but these are really low numbers, so it's hard to say for sure whether or not this, we have a chromium effect. You now we have three or four fish per group. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone in Lukai's lab who's contributed to this. Um, everyone in the WISE Lab has contributed to this, um, the U of L centers that have provided, you know, this provided opportunities for me to and, uh, work with other people on, on campus and to have this rich environment to pursue uh, a lot of my own interests. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. I cannot see if there's any on here. Yes, Evelyn? Uh, I may have missed it, but you were saying that mm -hmm. chromium accumulates uh, right? Yes. I'm wondering how it's going there. 
uh, the chromium, I, I don't know the ledger about the chemistry of it, but I think it does a react with water, but it reacts very strongly with oxygen. And this still was one of the barriers. So, how does it get to the ground? Yeah, the, so the question was um, for those that are remote, the question was about how chromium gets into the brain. Um, we don't know a lot about how it gets in the brain. Um, I, I, do, I do know that chromium can interact with hemoglobin because of that oxygen interaction. And so that could potentially carry it throughout the body. Um, you know, one provocative uh idea is especially with, with aging population where they have a degenerating uh, blood brain barrier that, that becomes more leaky so pre presumably more chromium could end at the brain um, but also it does hexavalent chromium in particular mimics phosphate and sulfate so it could simply be it crosses the blood brain barrier that way by by those those phosphate and sulfate channels on so it's more than in the aging than in the young but it does go through in the young yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a very good question, and you know the the field for chromium neurotoxicity is too small to really understand how that works. Um, and you know, I mean, blood blood brain barrier field is also still relatively young, so we don't have a very we only have a few in vitro models that are, are good for that, but they're very technical and require a lot of expertise. Um, so you know, there has that hasn't really been used with toxicology a whole lot yet. But yeah, really good question and something I'd really like to, to know a lot more about myself. All right, let's see. Yeah, Kyung? Yeah, um, I have a question regarding your new glioblastoma uh, cell line, the K versus J. And yep. I thought the results were kind of counterintuitive because cells go growth the rest or, or senescence when there's a DNA damage. And when that DNA damage is not resolved, that leads to senescence or cell death. But in your case, when the DNA damage repair in, uh, deficient cells, the cells continue to grow. So what that tells me is that the cells probably lack a checkpoint function like pp 3 or RB. So there's a, it, it seems to me that there's a defect in DNA damage checkpoint mechanism rather than, uh, so, so I think we, you know, you, you may want to think of it in that sense rather than thinking that, oh, you need DNA damage repair to cause the cells to senesce. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, no, I mean, because cells don't senesce because of the DNA damage per se, but it's the checkpoint uh, mechanism. If you three RB, if they are dysfunctional, obviously the cells will continue to grow, and that's what exactly happens in cancer cells, right? So the fact that the DNA damage, the, the J cells uh, continue to grow, it tells me that that might be a defect in uh, PP3 and RB. Yeah, so, so just for everyone remotely, the question was about the MO59K and J cell results um, and how it might be more of a checkpoint issue than a DNA damage repair issue. Um, that is something I'll have to look into with my, with, you know, with, with, with some QAQC stuff. But also, if I remember correctly, um, when it comes to chromium toxicity leading to cancer, P53 doesn't really have a role in that pathway. Um, I'm not the, ex the expert on chromium carcinogenesis, and unfortunately none of them are here um, in the room. Um, but I do seem to remember that that was something that came up and was like, huh, that's surprising. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. It's something I'll have to look at for my QAQC to make sure that I, I am following this, this pathway versus Know, some, but yeah, th those results all were baffling to me when I saw that as well. Yeah, Dr. States. Yeah, actually, some point, DNA PK is an apoclone kinase signaling the damage, so it is a signaling the damage. Okay. Not signaling the downstream to the All right. Between yes. Yeah, so yeah, that's why I, I hesitate to call it senescence. Yeah, and that's why, you know, the next experiments that I'll be doing are, you know, Western bots to really look at those senescence markers to firmly say whether or not it's senescence versus growth arrest. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're trying to find them, but. Well, I guess they're not showing up. Amanda asked, do the killfish exhibit the location of the shore beach similar to aged humans as well? Yes, they do. I don't know if chromium replacing zinc, I wouldn't expect it to because um, zinc's a divalent cation and chromium, hexavalent chromium is, uh, what, what is it? Six plus, no, six. It's, you know, I wouldn't expect it to have the right kind of biochemistry to re re replace zinc and zinc finger proteins. Um, and as far as whether or not zinc has a role, the levels that we're using are super low for zinc, so I really don't expect that to be um, an issue. I see another hand up, and uh, um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so I'm afraid that the tests that you're proposing, um, locomotor tests, may loss, etc., they may not be very sensitive to measure the normal aging changes. Um, you might have to use a DNA damage repair defect model, like an ATM knockout, for example, or an Alzheimer's model to test the cumulative effects of genetic predisposition and chromium uh, accumulation. What do you think about that? Well, it would be, it'd certainly be interesting to look at chromium in a genetic model like that. Um, but again, it, as you point out, if chromium is not going to have that strong an effect, we can't really, it becomes hard to say whether the effect that we're seeing is just due to chromium or due to chromium combined with this genetic variant. Um, so for starting off, it makes sense to me to make more, it makes more sense to me to start with just kind of a wild type rat. Um, if we don't see much with behavior, that's still informative. Um, you know, we're, we're working with concentrations that are within EPA standards. Um, so, you know, at the highest level that EPA considers safe in drinking water and then kind of half of that. Um, uh, looking at the literature, I do expect that it will induce some kind of pathology in the brain. Um, whether or not it induces behavioral, that's hard to predict, um, largely because there hasn't been a, a robust amount of behavior analyses looked um, for chromium literature. Uh, you know, there, we could, uh, you know, if we don't see anything with this first group, with a, a follow-up group, we could adjust which behaviors we're doing and try and get finer resolution. Um, but you know, we've I've discussed this with um, my, my co-investigators, Lukai and Junkai, and we we all agreed that this was the the right behavior battery to start with um, to at least get this discussion going, get this research going. But um, I appreciate your input on that. Dr. Weinstein here has a question or hand up. Okay. I don't. I, I don't have a question. I just. You made a comment. You were looking for chromium experts, and all of the chromium experts are actually online. I just checked the participants, and why they're not speaking up to to chime in, I don't know. But the answer is yes. P53 is not affected. Does not appear to be affected in chromium carcinogenesis. You had that right. Yeah, thank you. So the question is about um, whether or not Alzheimer's disease genes are affected by chromium, if we know anything about that. Um, the closest that I've seen has been with APOJ, and APO, APO genes are linked to Alzheimer's disease, you know, especially APOE3 and E4. Um, APOJ is more looked at with aging in general. I don't remember if it's been looked at with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but as far as 
you know, chromium neurotoxicity and genetic stuff, there's not a whole lot um, looking in the brain. I mean, there's one study that looked at NERF2, not surprisingly. Um, you now the other ones looked at JAK-STAT pathways and, you know, heme oxygenase 1, and no, nothing really robust uh, um, to, to answer the question you're, you're asking. There was a comment in the chat box. Great job. I have found this to be very accessible to those of us in the center in public health research. Very true. Oh, thank you. Uh, Tony, I have one more question. Yep. So, when you showed us the concentration of chromium in the human brain accumulation, the highest concentration was found in the pituitary right. and hypothalamus. Is that right? Well, uh, for, for the human brain, the highest levels were in the pituitary and the temporal lobe. Temporal lobe is kind of that the part of the cortex that sits so in the side of your brain. The pituitary gland is known to be the master gland. It, it regulates other endocrine glands throughout the body. Yep. And so, if you are, if you are were to look, look at the effects of chromium, in, you know, um, I guess it, you know, unbiased approach, I would look at the endocrine function. Is, is that something you you would consider doing? doing or? Something that I'm considering down the road of doing. Um, Interesting that you point bring up the pituitary uh, because pituitary has some of the weakest blood brain barrier, so that may be why it has high chromium. Um, but also, there's a fair amount of literature that suggests a pharmacological effect for trivalent chromium. And so perhaps that high level in the pituitary has to do with chromium, trivalent levels of chromium in the pituitary rather than hexavalent chromium. Um, you know, the all the chromium accumulation studies didn't speciate it. It's really hard to do that. Um, so, you know, that seems to give it a little bit more credence to me, at least, about chromium or trivalent chromium having a potential pharmacological effect. Um, you know, if metabolism is an issue with aging, and that is something that um, I would like to, like to tie in down the road. Um, it's just the, the, the genetic, the DNA damage and the chromosome instability stuff really caught my attention as far as, you know, one, a new mechanism for aging, and, you know, two, it, it ties with chromium toxicity really well. Uh, uh, this brain aging could be secondary to the endocrine dysfunction, right? Yeah, yeah, could be. Um, I'm going to point out another possibility, it's actually very interesting on your slides, is that it's uh, affecting a very specific type of neuron, Yeah, so Dr. Barnes just pointed out about how chromium might be targeting interneurons, and that could, could contribute to the brain aging phenotype differently than, um, yeah. yeah, which is a very interesting point. The brain is known with aging, of course, to specific types of cells, um, and interneurons are among the types of cells that are most lost, and those that uh, are back, of course, high in Okay. All right. I guess that concludes today's talk.